welcome to Serial Killer Saturday. Today we are going to talk about John Reginald Halliday Christie, or Reg to his acquaintances, or the Rillington Place Strangler to police and the wider community. This man sang in his church choir and was a Boy Scout. When he finished school, he began working as an assistant projectionist. He was mild-mannered, some who knew him would say, quiet. His childhood peers, with the bluntness that children have by nature, described him as unpopular, weird, and they branded him Reggie No Dick or Can't Do It Christy because of his failures with the opposite sex. It was said that he could only perform with sex workers, though his postmortem found that he was physiologically normal. He was also an infantryman in World War I, serving in France as a signalman. He would claim that he was rendered blind and mute for three years in a mustard gas attack, but in reality, he was found fit for duty after about a month in a military hospital. That would not be the only whopper this man told. Christy grew up in Northrum in Yorkshire. He had six siblings and he was second youngest. By all accounts, he had a cold, troubled relationship with his father, who was a carpet designer. Ernest John Christie was an austere man who communicated little, unless it was to punish his children for whatever trivial offense they might have committed. His mother and his elder sisters both coddled the young man and bullied him. He would later say that it was when his grandfather David died and he viewed the man's body laid out in the family home, that he felt a sense of power. The man he once feared was no more. After that, he would say corpses were fascinating to him. He married Ethel Simpson in May 1920 and had a rather bizarre relationship with her. His previous impotence remained, so he continued visiting sex workers. After about four years, Ethel returned to her family and moved to Sheffield. Christie himself moved to London, where he would be in and out of prison for about 10 years. After a prison release in 1934, he reunited with his wife, and together they moved to 10 Rillington Place in Notting Hill. His early crimes were mostly for thefts of different types, but there was also the time he hit Maud Cole, who he was living with at the time, over the head with a cricket bat. When he reunited with Ethel, they moved into the top floor of the house on Rillington Place, but would later move down to the main floor. Accounts of the place describe it as squalid. Each floor was a flat, and the tenant shared one lavatory, which was outside. It was near an above-ground section of the London Underground, so the noise from the trains would have been very loud. World War II would come around, and Christie became a war reserve police officer, because no one did any criminal records checks on him. During that job, he began an affair with a woman named Gladys Jones, that affair ended when Gladys's husband returned from the war and found Christie in their home. It would be after this affair that Christie would begin his murder spree. Well, at least as far as we're aware, as you'll see, there are suspicions that he committed more murders than those he was caught out on. His modus operandi usually included rendering his victims unconscious with gas, then strangling them, and raping most of them as they lay unconscious or even after they passed. Christie's first victim was Ruth First, who was 21 years old and a munitions worker from Austria. She was also sometimes a sex worker. We only know from his statements what happened to her, and his telling may not be the most accurate. He claims he met her while she was soliciting clients at a snack bar. He brought her home while Ethel was visiting relatives. He says he strangled her with a rope impulsively. He hid her under the floorboards of his living room before burying her in the garden a day later. He was a special constable at the time of this murder, 
resigning later that year. He went to work as a clerk at a factory where he met Muriel Amelia Eady, who was 32, his second victim. She apparently had bronchitis. He lured her to his house by telling her that he could make her a special mixture there that would cure her condition. In fact, what he did was put Friar's Blossom in a jar with some coal gas and had her inhale the contents, which knocked her out. He raped her, strangled her, and buried her next to Ruth in the garden. Timothy Evans was a tenant in the house at Rillington Place, along with his wife Beryl and their baby daughter Geraldine. Tim, those who knew him would confirm, was of a lower than average intelligence and easily led. They lived there in 1948 and 1949. He was a 24-year-old van driver then, and while there, Beryl became pregnant with a son. It's unclear what exactly happened, but Evans told authorities that his wife went to Christie for help to abort the pregnancy. She and her daughter would end up dead, and Evans would be the one to go to police to report his wife's death. Heartbreakingly, Timothy Evans was charged with the murders of his family and hanged in 1950. Christy was the primary witness for the prosecution. After Evans was hung and after other victims of Christie's were found, the serial killer would admit to killing Beryl and her unborn male baby. He would never admit to killing Geraldine, but he most likely is her killer. Police mishandled the case so badly, including obtaining a false confession containing words Evans never likely would have used that Christie was able to go on and commit four more murders. He would, both before and after the false confession, tell authorities that Christie killed his wife, but that didn't really help him. It would not be until 2004 that a pardon was recommended for Evans to clear the man's name after a commission was put together to review criminal cases. That commission resulted from the actions of an infamous English serial killer couple, the Wesleys. There were a lot of issues with how the police handled the Evans case. There was even a femur propped up against a fence that was overlooked. So, the bodies in the garden were not discovered. Though the bodies of Beryl and Geraldine had been in the wash house outside, police didn't even go into the wash house. No systematic search of the premises or the garden or the outbuildings was ever conducted. Statements by builders who'd been working at the residence were also ignored. They neither looked into or questioned Christie's statements in the matter. Had they looked any further, they would have learned that Christie himself uh, held himself out as an abortionist, that he had a violent record and a record of dishonesty. But no, he had once been a policeman, so they took his word. Had police been less focused on obtaining a false confession from Evans, both Evans and four further women might have been saved from their deaths. Christie found a job at a bank after the Evans murders, but was fired after they learned of his criminal record. He moved along to British Road Services in 1950. New tenants moved in from the West Indies, which riled the racist Christie. He somehow managed to get exclusive use of the garden in that time, likely to stop anyone from discovering the bodies that were buried back there. At the end of 1952, Christie would strangle his wife, Ethel, in their bed. There is no explanation for that. He then set about making up stories and trying to cover up or explain away Ethel's sudden absence. He wrote to her relatives in Sheffield, claiming that Ethel's rheumatism was so severe that she was prevented from writing herself. He told a neighbor that Ethel had gone to Sheffield to visit those same relatives. Or she went to Birmingham. 
It's unclear why he murdered Ethel, but he did quit his job about eight days before she died. And just a few days after she was killed, he sold her wedding ring and then some furniture. A little more than a month after the murder, he drained her bank account. Then the next month, sold some of her clothing. Apparently, no one ever questioned the property going missing. Perhaps no one ever noticed. What we do know is that in the three or four months following Ethel's murder in December 1952, Christie would take the lives of three more women, Kathleen Maloney, 26, who was a sex worker, Rita Nelson, 25, who was pregnant and visiting relatives and most likely visited Christie to, an, to attempt an abortion, and Hectorina McClellan, 26, a young woman he met in a cafe. Christie let McClellan and her boyfriend, Alex Baker, stay in Rillington Place while they were looking for accommodations for themselves. It was shortly after that he was able to get McClellan alone at the house that he killed her. He would tell Alex that he had not seen her. He even helped Alex search for her. By then he had found a simpler method for gassing these victims. He simply connected a tube to the gas pipe and closed it with a clip. When he wanted to gas a victim, he unclipped the tube and let gas fill the room. Or so he said. Once his victims were drowsy enough from the gas, he strangled them each. And it was each of these women, Kathleen, Rita, and Hectorina, who were found in the wallpapered alcove. Shortly after stashing Hectorina in that alcove, in March of 1953, Christie moved out of the flat and tried to illegally sublet it to another couple. The landlord kicked them all out and then let the top floor tenant use the kitchen in Christie's flat. It was the upstairs tenant, Berthford Brown, who discovered the little alcove and the bodies. His discovery set off a wide search for Christie across the city. In the meantime, he was over in King's Cross, having rented a room under his real name. He left that room and just kind of wandered about, sleeping outside and spending most of the day in theaters and cafes. He didn't stay free long, though. He was arrested by March 31st, 1953. At first, he would only admit to the obvious bodies, the three women in the alcove and his wife, Ethel, who he hid under the floor in the living room. When police mentioned they found skeletal remains in the garden, he admitted to those deaths as well. And eventually, he admitted to Beryl's murder but continued to resist admitting to little Geraldine's murder. Probably to keep himself safe in jail. Maybe to prevent a jury from being alienated. It's not clear. He tried to plead insanity when he was brought to trial for his wife's murder. It would be the only murder he was charged with. But the state's expert would say that he was just a hysterical personality and he was not insane. The jury deliberated less than an hour and a half. They rejected his insanity plea, and he was ultimately sentenced by the judge to hang. A lot of serial killers collect trophies, and for Christie, it was pubic hair, at least for his wife and the women he killed after her. Based on his collection, there was likely at least one more victim of Christie's who was never identified. Two different inquiries were launched into Evans' trial and hanging. One, criticized for how quickly it was done and for bias, found Evans must have killed his wife and daughter. The second, found that it was probable that Evans killed Beryl, but that Christie killed the child. However, that second inquiry also found that a jury should not have convicted Evans as there was sufficient reasonable doubt about what happened. No kidding, right? 
In 2003, however, the Home Office cleared Evans of both murders and settled compensation with the man's family. More importantly, Evans' case, along with a few other controversial capital cases, led to the 1965 suspension of the death penalty in the United Kingdom and eventually to the abolishment of the death penalty there. The house on Rillington Place has long been demolished after being renamed Rust and Close. The lot still exists, but now it's on a road named Bartle Place, and there is no longer any sign of the infamous house, its inhabitants, or its history. That's it for today. If you enjoy stories about uh, serial killers and what happened in their cases stay tuned we're going to be doing this every saturday Uh, like comment share subscribe and turn on your notifications uh, if you want to know when we post thank you so much for listening i really appreciate it till next saturday